Um, so yes, thank you. Uh, I'm David McKechnie. I'm based at the University of Strathclyde and I'm going to talk today about some of the work we've been looking at for heterogeneous nucleation and particularly how interfacial concentration effects can impact this process. So crystallization is an important purification process that's used across a wide range of industries, including pharmaceuticals, fine chemicals and food. But despite this widespread use, our understanding of primary nucleation, which is the initial formation of the crystalline particles from solution, remains quite pure. Uh, pure. And if we could gain a better understanding of this process, we could better control our crystallization processes. And this makes it a real point of industrial importance. But um, nucleation is a stochastic process. And this means we need to gain a large volume of data before we can gain any sort of insight into the nucleation behavior for a given system. And this alongside um, increase in pressure within industry for um, processes to be developed using less and less starting materials has resulted in the increase in the popularity of small scale experimental setups, such as the ones that are shown in the center of the slide here. Um, so in the case of microfluidics, which we have on the left, we have small volumes of our solution in contact with an immiscible oil, which is in place to maintain the size and shape of the droplets throughout the experiment. And in the case of the micro wells, the wells of a microplate will be filled with a solution, which as these are then open to the air, will typically be covered with a layer of oil to prevent any evaporation occurring throughout the experiment. So in both of these cases, we have a small volume of our solution, and this is in contact with an interface with a very high surface area to volume ratio. And this ratio is important, as this means that heterogeneous nucleation can dominate the nucleation kinetics going on within the experiment. And this means that the data that um, you gain from these experiments might not be transferable to macroscale crystallizations where the interfaces will be significantly different. So the aim of our work was to experimentally investigate the heterogeneous nucleation of a model system of aqueous glycine solution in contact with the lead of tridecane. And then once we start to spot some differences between the nucleation behavior for air solution interfaces and oil solution interfaces, we want to use molecular dynamic simulations to try and dig a little bit deeper into what's causing these changes. So as I've mentioned, our molecule of choice is glycine, and this is the simplest amino acid, and it's commonly used for these types of nucleation studies. It's very well studied, it's easy to handle, and it also has a range of interesting properties. Um, it's polymorphic and exists as three different crystal structures under standard conditions, and it's also been observed to form mesoscale clusters in aqueous solution, which makes it an interesting choice when you think about two-step nucleation versus classical nucleation theory. We chose to use tridecane as our liquid-liquid interface, as this has been used previously in the literature where it was originally chosen due to its immiscibility with water and its low vapor pressure. So our experimental method is designed so that we can carry out a large number of small scale experiments simultaneously. And we do this by preparing a large number of small glass vials of supersaturated glycine solution. Um, we have our control experiments shown over here where we have just the solution and the sealed vial with the air up above. And then in the other vials, we place a layer of tridecane over the top, which gives us the liquid liquid interface that we're interested in. We prepare these um, vials at high temperatures and then cool down to generate the supersaturation that's required for the nucleation. And we then move them into our observation setup that can be seen in the middle of the screen here. We have an incubator for temperature control, which just maintains the isothermal conditions throughout the experiment. And we have webcams positioned on either side of the vial rack in order to take pictures every five minutes to allow us to determine when the nucleation has occurred. Here on the right, we have an example image from the webcams that just shows that we can have a large number of these vials running simultaneously to really let us create this large volume of data that's necessary. So in terms of the experimental results, first, I would like to talk about what happens when we don't have the oil present. Um, we've investigated concentrations from 275 grams per kilogram all the way up to 450. And as you can see, we have very little nucleation occurring um, and the nucleation is, is very slow for these conditions. 
Um, we don't have any nucleation occurring at all until we reach 450 grams per kilogram. And even at this point, we only have 5% of our total vials nucleating within the three days that we've observed them for. Once we add in a layer of oil, we see a significant increase in the nucleation rate, where now we have a majority of the vials nucleating within the three-day period at concentrations where no nucleation has been observed previously. So these results are already showing that the presence of the interface has a significant impact on the nucleation behavior. So what we have here is heterogeneous nucleation, and it's well understood that this occurs more quickly than homogeneous nucleation. And there are a range of different mechanics that have been proposed and accepted that contribute to this effect. Um, the textbook answer comes from classical nucleation theory, which states that there is a reduced nucleation barrier um, for heterogeneous nucleation, which allows a smaller critical nucleus size and um, nucleation is then able to happen more quickly. Um, but there's been other effects proposed, such as epitaxy or physical templating, where the physical shape of the interface has some affinity for the crystal structure that's being formed and helps to guide the molecules into that initial crystal nucleus shape. Um, there's also specific um, and molecular interactions that can occur between the functional groups of your interface with the functional groups with the solute molecules that once again can start to guide the molecules together and help them align to form the initial nucleus. But if we stop to think about our system, um, we have a liquid-liquid interface. So epitaxy doesn't seem like it would play a major role here. There's not a, a strong shape to help guide the molecules. And in terms of specific molecular interactions between the interface and the solute, um, our interface is just um, tridecane. So it's a straight chain alkane and it's not of particular chemical interest. So it seems unlikely that this will play a major role here either. So we've used molecular dynamic simulations that have been run using lamps and we have simulated the oil solution interface and the air solution interface, as you can see here on either side of the screen. Um, so here in both cases, we have the glycine molecules in blue, the water molecules in red. And for the oil, solu um, oil solution interface, the tridecane molecules are shown here in green. For the air solution interface, we run this in NVT so that we can maintain a vacuum layer on either side of the system. And this then is to represent the air solution interface that we had in the experiments. In both cases, this concentration works out to around 307 grams per kilogram. And we run at 298 Kelvin um, and then one atmosphere for the NPT of the oil solution interface. So first I would like to talk about the density profiles that we obtain from these simulations. Um, here we have the water in red, the glycine in blue, and the tridecane in green, colored the same as the snapshot up above. And here we can see we have an increase in the concentration of glycine molecules at this oil solution interface. If we now look to the air solution interface, we have the opposite effect where now the glycine molecules are retreating from this interface and trying to move as far as they can. And we actually end up with an almost pure water region right in that interfacial space. So if we define one nanometer regions at each of the interfaces, this allows us to put some numbers to this. And if we remember that the overall bulk solution is 307 grams per kilogram, we have an enhanced concentration at the oil solution interface of 386 versus the depleted concentration of 156 at the air solution interface. Now, as the nucleation rate is very strongly linked to the supersaturation, this begins to give us uh, a clear idea of why we see such a stark difference between the two different experimental setups. So if we come back to this question about the enhanced nucleation, um, realistically, the reduced nucleation barrier will probably still play a role in what we see here. But as I've discussed previously, the epitaxy or the specific molecular interactions don't seem like they would play a major role here. Instead, our simulations suggest that there's concentration enhancement at the interface. And we believe that this is due to non-specific van der Waals interactions between the interface as a whole and the solute molecules within the solution. So this raises some questions about what the nature of this interfacial interaction is. Um, we would like to confirm that it is in fact dispersion forces that drive this effect. And if this is the case, can we somehow test how the dispersion forces will affect the interfacial concentration of glycine within these systems? 
So we chose to do this using a model interface, which was a Leonard Jones 9-3 wall potential. And this provides us an interface with tunable dispersion forces. Um, this can be obtained by integrating a half lattice of Leonard Jones 12-6 atoms. And this is the functional form of the Leonard Jones wall that is implemented in LAMPS. So similar to the Leonard Jones 12-6 that we'll all be familiar with, the epsilon is related to the depth of the potential well, while the sigma here is controlling the point at which the potential crosses the x-axis and goes from repulsive to attractive. Here we have z, as we're only really interested in the distance perpendicular from the interface that each atom will be um, to choose the interaction strength. So we've carried out a range of simulations of small films of glycine solution in contact with the Leonard Jones 93 walls. Um, we've done this for a range of epsilon and sigma parameters where our epsilons range from one up to 20 kcal per mole and our sigmas range from 0.17 up to 0.51 nanometers. I've chosen the sort of four extreme corners of this grid to show as example profiles here. Um, and there's a couple of things that we can see straight away that are a little bit different from the previous simulations. Um, right now, we can see that there is quite significant layering of both the glycine and the water at the interface. Um, but this is just due to the flat fixed nature of the interface within these simulations. Um, whereas in the previous, as the interface is fluid, um, these layers would be disrupted and smeared across by capillary waves, and we would require more advanced interfacial analysis techniques to try and pick out that information. We can see as we move from left to right, where we have the increase in epsilon, that there's quite a significant increase in the density of glycine in this interfacial region. And more so on the left-hand side, we can see that there is also an increase in the density as we move from a lower to a higher sigma. On this plot on the right, we've plotted the interfacial glycine density against epsilon. And this is for the, the full 18 simulations that make up this entire grid. And here, each of the different colors represents a different sigma. So we can see that as the epsilon increases, the interfacial glycine density increases up to a point where this plateaus. But this is just due to the small nature of our systems here. We can see that the, the glycine is quite severely depleted in the bulk of the film. Um, if we had larger systems here, we would expect it would still plateau eventually, but maybe not so strongly as here. Um, we do see that there is the increase with sigma, but this is certainly less pronounced than the increase in epsilon. And we actually have, you know, some overlap of the points between the three sigmas that we've investigated here. So we wanted to relate this back to realistic materials. So we developed a type of mapping procedure that allows us to get epsilon and sigma parameters that reasonably represent the um, realistic materials. And we've carried this out for heptane, tridecane, and graphite. Um, so in terms of the wall strength, they, they are in that order with heptane followed by tridecane and graphite. And we can see that we do have this increase in the interfacial density going up. What's interesting is that in all three cases here, we do see an enhancement of the glycine density. Um, so we predict that all of these will increase the nucleation rate, similarly to tridecane, as we saw in the experiments. But we do expect that graphite will have the most, um, most powerful increase in this nucleation rate. So to conclude, we find experimentally that the layer of tridecane has a large increase in the nucleation rate of glycine. And our molecular dynamics simulations suggest that this is due to uh, increased concentration of the molecules within the interfacial region. We believe that these effects are likely due to non-specific van der Waals interactions. And we think that this will also help us to explain the enhanced nucleation of glycine that we've observed at hydrophobic solid solution interfaces such as PTFE. We predict that heptane and graphite will also see similar increases to the nucleation rate of glycine. However, we believe that graphite will have the greatest enhancement of nucleation at this time. I'd like to thank the EPSRC for the funding that allowed this work to be carried out, as well as the Carnegie Trust for funding the computational work, while Archie West is the HPC based here at the University of Strathclyde, where all of our computational results were obtained. I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I will hopefully now answer any questions you may have.